Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another exclusive interview by Recovery Today Magazine at recoverytodaymagazine.com, where first and foremost, we're a magazine of hope. Whether you're considering addiction recovery for yourself or a loved one, or maybe you've been in recovery for many years, you're going to find all kinds of information related to addiction recovery and living a happy, successful, and sober life here at Recovery Today. My name is Rob Hanley, and I'm the producer of Recovery Today Magazine. And as usual, I am so excited about who I get to talk to today. Please meet Steve Arterburn. And Steve is the founder and chairman of the New Life Recovery Ministries, and he is the host of the syndicated Christian counseling talk show, New Life Live. It is heard and watched by over 2 million people every week on nearly 200 radio stations nationwide, including XM and Sirius and also the NRB Network. He's the founder of Women of Faith Conferences that are attended by over 5 million people, and he serves as a teaching pastor in Carmel, Indiana. But wait, there's actually quite a bit more. He has been featured on Oprah, Inside Edition, Good Morning America, CNN, uh, New York Times, USA Today, U.S. News and World Report, ABC News, GQ, and Rolling Stone Magazine. And the best part here, over 100 books that he has written that has sold over 11 million copies, including Every Man's Battle, Healing is a Choice, The Seven-Minute Marriage Solution, which I want to hear all about. And, but we're going to focus on the Life Recovery Bible, which has over 3 million issues in print. I can't tell you how excited I am to, to spend some time with you today, Steve. Thank you for carving a little a minute out of your schedule. Thank you, Rob. Good to be with you. Well, I'm going to jump right into kind of the crux of, of I've got a whole bunch of great questions, that at least I think they're great questions that I wanted to ask, but I wanted to focus initially on the Life Recovery Bible. Uh, um, as I said, kind of before we started um, the interview here, um, Recovery Today magazine is not a Christian magazine. I'm a Christian, love the Lord dearly. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the Life Recovery Bible. And kind of the main question uh, that I have, first of all, is, you know, kind of like, I don't want to say why a new Bible or why a different Bible, but why not just like the regular King James, New King James? Why a Bible for those that are in recovery? And tell us a little bit about what it is. So uh, the last transcript that uh, Dr. Bob Smith um, the speech he gave, his last speech, the transcript, I got a hold of it, and he says in there that he and Bill W., they, we got the 12 steps, he says, from the good book. And he, and he mentions three places. He says the Sermon on the Mount, you know, the Beatitudes especially, uh, the book of James, uh, and then the 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter. And Bill Wilson, uh, in 1935, he says, uh, we didn't invent these steps. We discovered them. They got them out of the good book. They had been going to the Oxford groups, which was a Bible-based uh, group. And everything that the steps tell you to do uh, or tell you what they did, well, it's all in, in the Bible. There's nothing that doesn't count in the Bible. So I had uh, a dream of creating a study Bible for people that are recovering that would just love to kind of get a note or two about a verse. How does that apply in my life as a recovering person? Uh, devotionals that would, you know, have some scripture, but also really focus on the steps to be something beyond what the big book is. And I submitted uh, a proposal to Tyndale House Publishers, and they had a meeting. And um, half of the room was looking at my proposal, and the other half was looking at a proposal for the same thing from Dave Stoop. And when they agreed to do the Bible, they said, well, let's go call Steve and tell him we'll do it. And the other half said, what do you mean, Steve? I thought we were talking about Dave Stoop's proposal. So Dave and I ended up working together on this. And what we used for this study Bible, we found seminary professors and guys teaching in Christian colleges, theologians, that were all recovering. So... These guys in prison are sitting there reading, you know, this thing that's written by a Bible scholar, but it's talking their language, and they, they love this Bible. In fact, a year ago, uh, Prison Fellowship, uh, I just talked to the head of Prison Fellowship uh, last week, and he told me 
they discovered they had $650,000 of designated funds for Bibles for prisoners, but they were using about 65000 a year. He went to his people and said, what Bible do prisoners want the most? And they said, oh, the Life Recovery Bible. So a year ago, they created a prison fellowship edition, and in that, and any prisoner that fills out a card, they'll send him in either English or Spanish this giant Bible because eyewear isn't very good, lighting isn't very good. And so now these prisoners get all these free Bibles. And, you know, Dave and I have just been absolutely amazed at the response uh, because Tyndall thought they'd produce about 100,000 Bibles. We're, we're into the second edition of it, and we're at 3 million now. And every year it sells more Bibles than the year before. That is just not heard of in the world of, of Bibles. I think that it is so cool. Um, I, you know, I look at, at the Bible itself, being, being somebody that reads the Bible, and I, and I like to kind of break down um, every, um, you know, every parable that's in there, every uh, story. And it's interesting to me because we're, as human beings, we transfer information, like, through stories. And so what I love about the Life Recovery Bible is, that, like, all the stories and kind of the nuances of it in there because I, I think that's how we really connect. I think it's sad that a lot of people think that the Bible itself is so dogmatic or it's outdated or, you know, they think, ah, it's not even any true. Did Jonah really get swallowed by a whale and all right. that kind of stuff? It's it's a myth, you know, it's like Greek mythology or something like that. Um, I, I, you know, I've done a lot of research on it. I'm fully convinced it's absolutely true. But I like the story aspect of it because this is how we, we really – um, transfer information, I think, to, to one another. Yeah. Well, you know, a really cool thing happened. Um, Colt Moyers, uh, he is the son of the great journalist Bill Moyer, and he had been in treatment uh, about 11 times. And in his book, he says in the final treatment, um, this, this chaplain asked him, is there anything I could get for you? Uh, that might help you. And he was so desperate, cocaine, he was really struggling. And he said, the last treatment I was in, a guy had a life recovery Bible. And he said, could you get me one of those? And he says that he believes, and he writes it in his book, he believes that was the difference in him getting sober. Well, now he's on the Hazelden Betty Ford uh, board. And if you go to the Hazelden catalog, you'll see the life recovery Bible there. When I saw that, now, I mean, I've been working in this industry for years, and it was kind of like the good housekeeping seal of approval. Sure. We had created something, um, you know, out of the Christian faith that, that, you know, the AA community, the full-on addiction community, Hazelden and all, could say, yeah, this is helpful uh, to alcoholics and drug addicts. Is it, um, I think you already answered the question kind of by, by referencing uh, Bill W. and stuff, but I assume that it's a 12, a 12 step, you know, uh, as the perspective is all 12 step kind of abstinence. Oh, it is. It's got a study of the 12 steps. Um, it has devotion, a devotional um, tr chain in it for all the steps, uh, for, for principles. Um, and then, uh, in addition to that, it has study notes that take the whole Bible, and at the bottom are all these notes that these Bible scholars wrote. And even the introduction in the chapters, it's all about your recovery and your working the 12 steps. And, and it's just been such a joy um, to go into literally maximum security prison where the guys are wearing orange uh, uniforms so that if they escape, you can see them easily. Right. And discover Bible scholars there, these guys that are yeah. absolutely uh, know more about the Bible than I do because they just read it. They and I, the other day I was in one. And a guy, his cover, it was duct tape. He had used it so much, it just fallen apart. So maybe he'll get one of these new uh, prison belts. So you got to know that the Lord just loves that. It's funny. Yeah. I, I, one of the questions I had, you know, is, is someone re re revolving around like, well, how do you get to, you know, how do you get to know the Lord, you know, more or better? And it's funny. I, I would tell my own kids, well, you know, if somebody that you wanted to get to know was a best-selling author, one of the ways that you probably get to know them would be to read their book. That would probably yeah. be, especially if it's a book of instruction, really. Right. Um, I, I have never really thought of the. I think a lot of people that are not 
Christians or they don't read the Bible, they think of the Bible or um, even Christianity about something that's going to be very restrictive to them. And I have always thought of it, well, not always, but originally, I was raised Catholic originally before I you know, became a born-again Christian, but um, I've always kind of saw it almost as freedom, really, like almost the opposite of like something that is dogmatic. Um, you know, people think today that like uh, Christians are, I think people that are not Christians, they think that Christians are very judgmental and things like that. What would you say, I mean, how should a Christian actually approach and kind of live their life? Like what, what's kind of the, you know, the, the ideal Christian person, would you think? Well, to me, it's, um, you know, somebody where uh, the inside uh, matches the outside. And, you know, there, there are a lot of um, Christians that are, kind of the stereotype uh, Christian, that they yell and scream. Uh, they, they have a lot of stuff that they talk against. And people think that that's what Christianity is all about. Whereas, you know, if you look at the Bible, uh, it does say that when Jesus sets you free, you're free indeed. Who, you know, if, if I had not done steps eight and nine, which is also right there, in the, the Bible says, if you're, if you've got this gift for God and you're, you're going to give that to God, it says God doesn't want that gift until you go make things right with anybody that has something against you. Go do that. That's a bigger priority than bringing your money or your goat in the sacrifice for God. It says go do that and then come back. Well, I did that. I made a list according to step eight, and then I made restitution to people. Everybody I could contact, I made restitution. One guy, I had worked in his store. I stole about $1,000 of stuff. I calculated over the years what, what that would have earned him in a savings account based on interest. Well, you remember, home mortgages used to be like 15% and stuff. So I realized I owed him $6,000. So I find the guy, write the check, write the letter, uh, kind of hinted in the letter if he didn't want to use it, you know, maybe. <laughs> but about two weeks later. Back, donated. Yeah. But about two weeks later, um, the thing, he cashed the check, and I got a letter. And it said, you know, when you own something, this big department store thing, uh, everybody wants something from you. And he said, I'm so tired of people wanting something from me. I was about to give up. And your letter came, giving something back to me. He said, you will never know how that changed my life. Well, it changed my life, too. Um, and, and so I did that. Now, now, I am free from all of the guilt, the shame, the remorse. If, if, you, if someone would say to me, hey, you act like you're a Christian. Didn't you get a girl pregnant in college? I'll say, yes, I did. And I wrote about it in this book and this book, and I spoke about it. Uh, they'll say, well, like... Didn't you like, get drunk all the time? Yes, and I wrote about it in this book. So there's nothing you could, I don't ever have to worry about my past, whether eternally or here, because it's all out there. What a great way to live. You know, my wife and I were talking. Um, I said, you know, if a woman came up to me and, and she offered herself to me, I would, I would be thinking, oh, so you would like for me to have some shame to live with for the rest of my life. All you have for me is shame. And that's why I would say, no, thank you. I'm committed here. I don't need shame. And when you look at what the Bible says, a lot of it's confusing, the Bible. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it is not confusing. As Mark Twain said, he said, it's not the stuff I don't understand that's a problem. It's the stuff I do understand that's the problem. But it says, you know, open up to somebody. Just like it says when after you, work, you make your inventory in the fourth step, take the fifth step. Confess. Open up to somebody. Because in secrecy, we get sick, sicker. In openness, we start to heal, and we develop community. So I would just say that don't judge Jesus or Christianity based on a bunch of weirdo wackos. I wrote a book called Toxic Faith. I think I described them pretty well. But have your own experience. Pick up the Bible and, and look at what it says, especially if you've been working the 12 steps. You will gain such a richer experience when you read the book that they came from, I, uh, I, I, yeah, that's that, that that's great. Um, you know, uh, if somebody is not 
uh, is not subscribed to a 12-step. Now there's a lot of different, um, uh, you know, paths, I guess I would say. Yeah. And even actually, strangely enough, I've met people in my Christian walk that have said, like, I went to a meeting or I did something, and God immediately, you know, took, took away um, yeah. all of my desire for alcohol, all my desire, like, miraculously, overnight. Uh, what are your thoughts kind of on, on, on that? I mean, is okay. that something that is just a feeling that happens, or what do you think? Or I mean, I've met people who have been sober for many years, and, like, it happened like that. So... I know a guy that he was drinking um, about two fifths of vodka uh, every other day or so, and he looked down in the uh, back in the old days when you turned on both faucets to shave and he had the water in the bowl. He saw his image, and immediately he was delivered from ever wanting another drink in his life. I know of many stories of people miraculously delivered from the desire for alcohol. But here's the thing: I've never met one who was delivered from the addiction into character. You don't have instant character. Nor have I ever met someone who was delivered and all the family around them was delivered from their anger, bitterness, resentment, from all the crazy stuff that person did. So if right now, if God gave you a gift that you no longer craved alcohol, sex, whatever it was, use that gift to start to grow in character. The 12 Steps are an amazing character-building program. If you don't like them, go pick seven somewhere else. Or, But everybody needs to be in a growth process. And here's what I've discovered. Growth happens in groups. And so find a group, get a plan, and grow. Why is that, that growth happens in groups? Is it because when somebody, is it because of this kind of this connectedness, like when somebody shares and you can go, ha, <laughs> That's me. Is that is that kind of why? Why is that? Well, first of all, we're relational beings, and we were meant to be in relationship. Um, you know, and, and if we're not, we feel isolated, alone, and we get kind of crazy. And there's something about uh, another person that affirms the good stuff we do or affirm some of the strengths or skills that we have, and also has the freedom to say to, her, to us, here's something I think you might not see. Here's something maybe would be great if you worked on that. Or that just doesn't fit with what, what seems to be right. Because we're blind. We all have blind spots. And yeah. we need other people who have permission to tell us the truth. Elvis Presley was addicted uh, to, you know, pain medication, codeine in it. He was constipated all the time. He died on the toilet with his underwear around his ankles because nobody had permission to tell him the truth. you got to stop this. And he had a heart attack because he was so constipated. Michael Jackson had nobody around right. him that was free to say, you have to get some help. And his sister Janet was kind of kept from him. So when you quit allowing people to tell you the truth in a healthy mutual relationship, you've really cut off the ability to grow. But when you yeah. find that great group, my wife does a group for women with sexual uh, integrity problems, a lot of men to porn affairs and stuff. And just for them to find a group of women where they can share that and open up, that's the beginning of freedom. I love that. I, I completely love that. I, I've been part of a, a men's group. Actually, we need to restart it. It kind of took a little break for a long time. And I love the uh, the kind of the uh, Bible verse that iron sharpens iron. And, yeah. and, of course, I like reading other people's mail. Um, I don't maybe necessarily like my mail to be read. But, um, you know, I, I think it's all a growth process that we're going through here um, today. So, uh, you know, one of the big elephants in the room in any conversation with any influencer at all it, in talking about recovery is this opiate crisis and really kind of this um, 
really an unprecedented uh, um, thing. I mean, what's going on here? I mean, I've, we've yeah. talked to congressmen, to, you know, like, well, it happened when pharmaceutical companies and this, that, and the other. And then we've had kind of people that I thought were more unlikely. I don't know what their spiritual faith was, but Russell Brand, the comedian, had said he thinks that addiction is a, is a spiritual disease. I mean, what, what do you see in terms of what's kind of going on with this, this crisis, this epidemic that we are in right now? Well, you mentioned I was a teaching pastor, and our church, we have about uh, 12,000 people in 11 campuses, and three of those campuses are in prisons. We have full-on churches in three prisons here in Indiana. Maybe uh, the fourth is, is about to open. And so we got a big church, got a lot of influence. My buddy Dave Stoop came in, and Dave's um, over 70. You'd never hear anybody say, hey, you ought to hear this dynamic speaker. But he came in and he spoke on the opioid crisis. His message was downloaded and viewed by more people than any other message in 2018. Not, in, not on Easter message, not on Christmas, but the opioid crisis because it is so pervasive in families, especially in the church. And, you know, I, I don't believe that the cause of addiction is spiritual at all. I believe addiction is a physiological phenomenon. Very few people that drink ever experience that physiological phenomenon. Almost every person who takes fentanyl experiences that physiological phenomenon. It is a physical disease. It has psychological and emotional symptoms, and it has a spiritual cure, you could say. That's how I view it. One of the most godly women in the Christian faith is a quadriplegic. She's an artist. She speaks. She writes music. Uh, there's not a more faithful person in the world, but she's got chronic pain from being a quadriplegic. And about three years ago, a doctor prescribed fentanyl for her, and she got addicted to it. So they said, hey, this is a new medication. You know, it doesn't have any addictive uh, properties. And so there's this innocent addiction. She didn't get addicted because she had some kind of spiritual deficit or something like that. It, it like so many other people, uh, takes, takes you by surprise. And once you're in it, you're in it, and you've got to recover from it. And that recovery must be a spiritual recovery, or it's just, you know, it's just faking it for as long as you can. Do you, think, do you feel, look at it as a disease, like an epidemic that we're having right now? Well, what is a disease? A disease has symptoms, and it has a treatment. Mm -hmm. Well, every addiction, no matter what it is, it has symptoms. It has a progressive path it takes, and it can be treated. So from that perspective, it's, a, it's not a communicable disease, but it's what you might call a developmental disease. But absolutely. But, you know, I don't, like, I don't want to get um, hung up on disease. If somebody doesn't like to call an addiction a disease, it's a problem. And, you know, uh, I just preached a sermon uh, called 12 Steps for Anyone. And, you know, the 12 steps are not just for drug addicts and alcoholics. They're for your problem. Whatever your problem is that's keeping you from loving people well, use the 12 steps to work on that problem, and you'll be quite happy that you did. I love that. Um, one of the books that you talked about uh, or that you wrote uh, was on healing. And um, I'm thinking, you know, not only in my own healing, metaphor, not necessarily me, but whomever it might be, my own healing or I'm praying for the healing. And it, it could be physical. It could be for, you know, addiction and things like that. But, you know, oftentimes, and in fact, I'll, I'll just tell you, you know, even a, um, about two months ago, I lost my sister. Um, she, she died and uh, died of, um, uh, she had ovarian cancer for about three years. And so, I, you know, I prayed for her, and she died. So I'm really sad about it because she was really amazing. But, I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah thank you. And, but what are your, uh, from somebody that's written a book about healing, and, I, and then I'm also taken back to one of my favorite stories, you know, truths in the Bible, of the woman with the flow of blood. I like to tell people, like, you know, Jesus, God didn't even have any, he had no say in that. Like, she's like, if I can only touch his garment, I'll be healed. And he's like, who touched me? Somebody touched me. And everybody's like, what are you talking about? They're, they're thronging around you. What are you talking about who touched me? He's like, no, somebody touched me differently right now. 
And like she, I like that some pastor I heard sometimes says she stole her healing. She stole. He didn't even know it. He, he didn't. Yeah. Who is it? Ah, I was you. So, I mean, kind of what are your thoughts on, like, somebody that has been praying for a miracle for themselves or for someone that they love, um, and they just feel like they're not getting any answer? Yeah. Well, God doesn't choose to heal people, every person, um, you know, before you die. And if he did healing wouldn't be called a miracle. It would be called something that happens all the time. And I believe a lot of strange things happen uh, when Jesus was walking the face of the earth. I mean, you, he put he spit in the ground and made some mud and put it on the guy's eyes. Now, you know, um, I know of a tribe in New Guinea that all came to become believers in Jesus when they heard this because the medicine men of the tribe if you had a wound, that they would spit on it. And when they read this story about Jesus, they said, hey, he's one of us. He's a spitter. <laughs> he used to spit. And so they all, they all became followers of Jesus. But a lot of things happen that then that don't happen now. And sometimes in God's plan, for whatever reason, he chooses to heal people. I know a guy in Utah who um, about now it's been 15 years ago, he was an atheist. He was in hospice dying of these uh, tumors in his head. Goes in for his final CAT scan. Doctor comes out and says, I don't know. You have no cancer. And he was, the only emotion he, had, he could get in touch with was anger. Threw a chair across the room. Broke uh, some equipment. They had to sustain him and sedate him. And about a year later, he became a believer in God. But So it wasn't like he earned his healing or anything. He was an atheist. But that's what God chose for that guy. Now, if that's not the case, then what can we do? Well, I wrote the book Healing is a Choice because we can choose to forgive. We can choose to confess whatever it is we need to get off. Our, that, that's a, a really cool thing is to make that kind of a choice which produces some emotional and spiritual healing. So let's do everything we can within our power. And even if God doesn't choose uh, to heal us physically, we're going to be emotionally and spiritually healed. And rather than wait around and do nothing for God, uh, you know, if he, you know, like heal me and then I'll serve you kind of thing or I'll clean up my act. Let's clean up our act and let's get ready for whatever happens, whether it's being physically healed or not. I love that. Okay, here's a good one for you. What are, uh, from somebody that has literally, you know, Edit in a three million page. All, all of the things that you've done, Bible wise. What are some of your own? I just shared one of mine. What are some of your own favorite Bible passages? Well, of course, James five sixteen says that if we confess our sins to one another and pray for each other, that we can be healed. Now, when I got a girl pregnant, uh, I paid for her to have an abortion. Um, and this isn't for anybody else. This is just my experience. I felt about three days later, I felt so much guilt and shame. Uh, I ended up with about 80 ulcers inside of me. And um, I had to drop out of school a semester. A doctor said to me, if something in your life doesn't change, you are going to die from these ulcers. Now, that was nothing more than I couldn't, I didn't tell anybody about what I had done. Uh, I, I was in living in secrecy and silence and really, really getting sicker and sicker. So I had a spiritual awakening, very similar to what Bill Wilson had. Uh, Bill Wilson read the book, um, The Varieties of, of Religious Experience uh, by James, and that's in, that some of that stuff is in the big book. Well, I had that, and I started to open up about what I had done, and all of a sudden, I started to get better. And over the period of about six months, I physically was healed from all of these ulcers inside of me because I was no longer carrying around this shame and isolation. So, of course, I encourage people to be open and honest with others. Otherwise, you're walking around with guilt, shame, remorse that maybe you don't need to have. But it goes beyond that. You need to make 
restitution. It's not just confessing, but do what else the Bible says and make restitution to experience a complete transformation of your life. I love that. Why do people, it seems like in third world countries like Africa, you know, I don't know, really poor, impoverished, or maybe people are persecuted, why is it that it seems like they experience more dramatic and profound um, miracles than we do here? Uh, yeah, you know, well, I think I'm wrong about that. Well, no, my experience is that that is true. I think there is uh, so much uh, less of, of for people to get involved with. You know, here uh, Satan does a really good job of uh, getting us distracted with all our stuff, and really all he wants. He doesn't want us to to worship him. He wants us to worship ourselves. And so when you get in some of these third world countries, there's not all this distraction. And so you really have, uh, he's doing his work because people are more spiritual when they don't have so much stuff to prevent them from being spiritual. So on both hands, I think you've got greater evil, uh, greater e a spirit of evil, you could call it. And then I think also because of that, you see greater miracles happen. At, at New Life, we do a marriage intensive where 95% of the people that come, they're going to get a divorce if we don't do something for them on that weekend. And the last one we did, I mean, worst cases we've ever seen. And they walked out of there. They're going to stay married. Some got remarried. And, and, and the, so the miracles were so much bigger because the people that came in were so much sicker. And so I do think that God works uh, better when we're not distracted. And I also think that people uh, are living on a different spiritual level in third world, world countries many times than we are over here. Is it maybe because of desperation is what I'm thinking? Like, I have nothing else. And, and it brings back, again, like I said, one of my favorite verses is this, the, is called, I think it's called the woman with the flow of blood. I mean, she would yeah. have been stoned to death. Uh, and they've seen every doctor, and I think she was actually rich, as a matter of fact, and spent all of her money on doctors because back then you'd be unclean. They'd just kill you in the street. And so she's like, like Jesus is her only last shot. Like she's desperate. And then it's literally life and death. If somebody would have identified her, they would have killed her right there. Is it something about this desperation, like I'll go to a marriage conference or whatever, because I mean, I got nothing else. Is that part of it, do you think? Well, um, William James said in his book that every religious experience begins with the cry, help. And I think that a, lo a person in a third world country uh, has an easier time of coming to the end of themselves than we do over here. But I really believe that's when God gets to work is when we finally say, I, you know, I can't handle this. You can. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surrender to you. That I have something. It is a, a colossal limitation in my life. And I need to quit making myself crazy trying to fix it, change it, control it. I can't do that. I think that's the beginning. And, yeah, when you get desperate, uh, then you're ready uh, to be helped. And it's a lot easier to get desperate when you don't have so many things propping you up or so many other options. But to me, that's, that's where the gold is, is when we finally realize there is nothing I can do. You know, when I quit drinking, I, I knew something because I'd worked with alcoholics for so many years. Alcoholics only have one thing in common. They have a high tolerance for alcohol. They can drink more alcohol than anybody else. Now, people say, oh, I was an alcoholic on a half glass of wine. No, you weren't. Because uh, you might have been a problem drinker and, you know, a little therapy, you didn't need that half glass of wine. But alcoholics get addicted to the chemical because they can drink so much of it. And so one day I had to say to myself when I was drinking about a bottle of wine every night, hey, you, your body is like all the people you've been helping all these years. Look at the tolerances going up. Sometimes it's instant, sometimes it's over time. But it was not going to go well for me. And so I made a decision to never drink again. Now, I can't get smarter and change my body. I can't get more spiritual and change my body. So it's a great gift when you realize 
you either have the biological predisposition to have alcoholism, which is a high tolerance, or you don't. And if you do, you can't change that, and the sooner you figure it out, the better. And the happier you'll be when you finally say, you know what? There's nothing at the end of my journey that says I'll be able to drink again. And so you develop a life where you don't want to drink again. It doesn't have anything to offer you except pain, heartache, and disappointment. Yeah, for, for me personally, it was actually kind of reprogramming my mind that um – I'm a non-drinker. I mean, I I stopped uh, drinking and doing drugs in my my late twenties, and um, it was like, um, you know, I I don't drink. I don't, you know, I'm the designated driver. I'm the guy that drives. No, I'm the guy. No, I don't drink. What do you have? I have a diet coke. I'm, you know, just this whole kind of persona inside and out of, um, you know, I I, I don't drink. Um, the the readers of recovery today. Uh, you know, cover a whole wide swath. I would say probably mostly, uh, we, I mean, we've got readers from all over the world. They're all different faiths and beliefs and things like that. And we're open to everybody. First and foremost, Recovery Today, as I said, we're a magazine of hope. We just want to see, you know, somebody, if we can have one person have one more day of sobriety and we can help in any way for one person, the starfish getting thrown into the sea kind of analogy, then we're happy about it. But I find that a lot of people, I mean, there's a lot of Christians, and there's a lot of people maybe were raised Christian or something like that. And then there's a lot of injuries, and there's a lot of hurts. I find a lot of times people will say, I'm not religious. I think maybe even myself that way. I mean, like I said, I was raised Catholic. I don't throw a, st I don't throw a stone at anybody at all. Um, but now I'm, I'm much more to like a relationship, relationship to Christ. But uh, um, I think there's this kind of this, this this upswell of people saying, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. What do you say to those that would say, I've been hurt by the church, or I'm this and that, um, you know, uh, you know those, kind of, those kind of people? Well, I think a lot of people have been hurt by the church, but there are a lot of churches that aren't hurtful. And just like in uh, our church, we have 12 life recovery groups that run all the time. My wife does one on Friday for anything called Recovery Girls. Uh, she operates uh, a Sunday evening group for women with sexual integrity problems. And then they, they do a thing for uh, young girls who are, you know, about 50% of young people think pornography is okay, and they're getting hooked on it. And, yeah. and so here's a church where you can come, and we're going to put you uh, in a group of other people that are just like you, and then we're not going to judge you or shame you when you're in the big church. But uh, if you came to our church, you'd say, this, has n this was nothing like the church that hurt me. This is a shame-free zone. We're just inviting you to something better, not trying to shame you out of something uh, that doesn't work for you. And, you know, the, the, there used to be a thing where the church hurt me, I'm alienated from God, so I'll just go to a recovery meeting and not go into churches. But now there's so many uh, churches with recovery groups of all kinds. And, you know, when I uh, wrote uh, Every Man's Battle with Fred Stoker 20 years ago, we talked about people getting addicted to pornography, and we have seen uh, millions of guys grab this book, New Life. We do a, an intensive for Every Man's Battle, and it's all being done through the church. We've got ministers coming in, saving their ministry because they got hooked on pornography. Is it bigger than the opiate crisis, pornography? Uh, I've heard some people say it's like what we see is the tip of the iceberg. And oh, there's no question. Young people. No question. Um, there is nothing more prevalent in, in, let's just say, the male population. And women, it's growing. But there's no problem that more men have than sexual addiction or just uh, being kind of attached, you could say, to inappropriate things that betrays uh, themselves or betrays the spouse uh, or girlfriend. And, and so, uh, I mean, if I stand up and talk about alcoholism, I'm talking about maybe 6% of the people in church are alcoholics. If I talk about opioid addiction, I might be able to get up to 20% or something like that when you consider how many people have kids uh, that are struggling with it. But when I'm talking about uh, a struggle with pornography, I know at least half the guys that I'm talking to are struggling with it because it is so uh, addictive and, and it's so available, so anonymous, 
And you know, if an alcoholic every day it's free, some, it's free. Yeah, and if you if you were an alcoholic, and somebody walked up to your door every hour and said, "Here's a here's a fifth of vodka." That'd be pretty tough to stay away from. Well, you've got your computer, you got your phone, and about every 15 minutes, if you've been looking at porn sites, the others are coming after you. They want you there. So it's a really tough uh, dilemma. But uh, what we've been able to do at New Life and through this book and, and the workbooks, um, we've been able to get people out of it, and they're so relieved. You know, it's not, well, you know, the cover of Time Magazine uh, three years ago, were about all these young guys giving up pornography, not because they wanted to get closer to God. They couldn't uh, have sex with their girlfriend. I've read and that. There's a reason for that. Yeah. Because when you have a sexual experience with something, oxytocin is secreted. It's the bonding hormone that bonds a mother to her baby. Well, us men, we, we experience that. We excrete that when we have an orgasm. It's not just dopamine rush but there's oxytocin. So you get bonded to the pornography. Well, when you're bonded to something, just like a mother's bonded to a baby, the cave woman, if she heard a lion outside the cave, she also wants to attack anything that's a threat to her baby that she's bonded to. So a guy doesn't understand, why do I hate my wife so much? Because she's threatening to destroy the bond you have with your pornography. Wow. And so, no wonder the woman you thought was everything and wonderful. It's not that she doesn't measure up to the women. You know they're just pictures. It's because you have this oxytocin bonding you to that sexual experience, and it makes you very, very aggressive toward anything that is a threat to it. Now, when people come to understand that, the lights come on. They go, no wonder I hate her. I, I, want, I can't be stand her. But you love your self-obsessed sex with yourself yeah. and women that literally, if you met them, wouldn't give you the time of day. That, I've never heard that. I mean, I was thinking like, oh, you're making spiritual agreements or, um, you know, things like that. But I had never heard about oxytocin and I've never thought of it like a way like a, a mother defending something. So It's so uh, true. We just did the second edition of uh, Every Man's Battle, 20th year anniversary. And that's the kind of stuff from brain science and stuff that we put in it. But that's what those guys uh, were experiencing as single guys who couldn't have sex with their girlfriends anymore. It, really, Hugh Hefner, you should read some of the stories about his sex life. Pornography neuters men. It doesn't make you a, yeah. a greater man. You need Viagra after pornography. No wonder there's so, so much Cialis and Viagra out there. It neuters you. It destroys the manhood. It doesn't make you. I make thought it was just because nothing is, it's not as sensationalized and things like that, or you just get so, you get numb to it. I never thought of it as, as like that. That's really interesting. Yeah. Well, I think it's all part of this continuum uh, for some people, you could say it's just looking at inappropriate pictures, and some it's hardcore violent uh, pornography. And you know what's so amazing is that pornography has become so much more acceptable in society, and yet the pornography moves much toward degradation uh, and, and sadistic behavior toward women. It's kind of weird the way it has been embraced as just something people do, and yet it progresses into something really horrific for most people. It really is. I, I, it's so, so destructive. Um, okay, here's another one I, I had written on my list here. It, so with everything that's kind of going on today, society-wise, if Jesus were, um, I don't want to say if he were alive, but it, let's say if he had a TV show or a serious channel or a Twitter account, what kind of things would he be saying today? What, what, kind, what would be, I, mean, I know that the message is, well, it's already in the Bible, but in terms of like relevant kind of stuff, like what would, what would some of the things that, that, what would be the underlying message do you think that, that Jesus would be saying if he had a, a, a multimedia broadcast to everybody today? Well, he tended to uh, speak in stories. And tell stories. So I think he'd probably say something like this. Um, have you seen these wax museums all around with these people? Um, 
some of these creatures look just like the real thing. And I know a lot of folks, he might say, if you can't be in the presence of Queen Elizabeth, you get some satisfaction of being right next to the perfect counterfeit. And he said, but you know it's just counterfeit and it's fake. He said, well, a lot of you folks, just like in a wax museum, you're, you're doing stuff that's the counterfeit of the real thing. You're in pornography rather than having a real relationship with me and a real relationship with a, another human being. Or you're in a relationship with an inanimate object called alcohol or a drug. And you're experiencing the wax museum of existence. Why don't you put that stuff down and let me help you become flesh and blood again, not a counterfeit. And your life is going to be so much better. I think he would say stuff like that. And invite oh, well, that's fantastic. That's a, what an awesome answer. So I'm going to close out uh, uh, my last question for you. I think is I, I kind of like to say is maybe my best. Try to save the best for last. But <laughs> yes. what is the purpose of our lives? I mean, why are we here? Yeah. This is a question I have pondered. For many, many years, I, I think I have the answer. I asked my older brother one time, and he's pretty smart about it. But what's the purpose of our lives? Why, why are we here? What is, this, what is this all about? Yeah. Well, I think that is the most profound question of the day, and for all of us. Um, you know, if you look at our vast universe, it's pretty incredible that of all these billions of stars out there, and we've been searching with Hubble telescope, all these things. And here's this marble, this beautiful Earth marble. We have the perfect amount of oxygen, carbon dioxide. We have the perfect amount of gravity where we're not flying up or we're not, it's not so great that we're slithering like snakes. All of this stuff, you either believe it was an accident or just maybe somebody had a plan and that plan was God. So, you know, God in the form of Jesus comes to earth, puts on an, uh, an earth suit and he says this when somebody asks him, what's the most important thing? He says, well, I think the most important thing is to love God with everything you have. And what I think is so amazing is this God that made all of this universe has a place for us and does stuff to draw us to him. And he wants a relationship with us. So Jesus says this, and only Jesus can say this. Jesus says, I, I think you should love God with everything you have. And he says, second, but equal. Now only Jesus can say, now this is number two, but it's equal. Because Jesus is God. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, you know, um, if you do those things, all of the other commandments will take care of themselves. So I come down to this, loving well. That's our purpose. Love God well. Love people well. And when you come to the realization that something is standing in the way of you loving people well, whether it's your ego or your denial or your addiction or whatever, Go get that taken care of. And when you do, I think you're going to be so much better off in this world loving people well rather than having to make up for or compensate some of the hate, some of the criticism, some of the negativity that your addiction or your compulsion or your obsession is putting into the world. So I just boil it down to two words, our purpose, loving well. I love that. That's, that's awesome. Really, really good stuff. Well, as I told you before, I hit the record button here. Um, you know, I'd monopolize, occupy your entire day <laughs> and tomorrow and probably the next few days as well at least. But I just want you to know that I really appreciate uh, you spending time here today. Um, it was a real pleasure. Great um, talking to you. And if I could just tell folks, you know, if uh, we have an 800 number, 1-800-NEW-LIFE. If Absolutely. You want, if you want to get in touch with you, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, if you want a life recovery Bible, 
there is the Life Recovery app uh, on the App Store. And then also, uh, since pornography is so pervasive, at 1-800-NEW-LIFE, we do an Every Man's Battle workshop. It's just 48 hours, but we've seen a lot of guys uh, get a lot of help. I do a workshop called Finding Freedom, and um, it really does provide a lot of freedom for a lot of different things. You know, I, 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 I've struggled with just about everything, whether it's pornography or uh, I, I used to be um, 60 pounds more than I am today. I was carrying a little third grader around with me all the time. So if you've got a problem, <laughs> we've got uh, something we think that can help you at 1-800-NEW-LIFE. Fantastic. And we're going to include all of those in this article. If you're watching the interview right now, in the article, in the body right here, you should be able to just to tap, go right to the Bible. You can buy the Life Recovery Bible. It's awesome. There's also an app, Google Play and iTunes uh, for it. And then uh, call the number, get back to, join one of the groups, do whatever you would like to do. And um, it's all, all will be right in the, uh, in the interview here. So, Steve, thanks so much for, uh, for this. For your time today. It was a real pleasure. And uh, this is a wrap, another exclusive interview with Recovery Today Magazine at recoverytodaymagazine.com. If you hang on one sec, I'll stop the uh, recording.